Developers love it when their games do well. I mean, that's kind of the point other than the creative fulfillment element of it. It takes a lot of work to make a game and getting rewarded for that's great, but what happens when the success is so much more than you could possibly imagine? Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 10 surprise hits that shocked their own developers. Starting off with number 10, it's Baldur's Gate 3. Solarian Studios, pretty, pretty successful, right? We all know that. Like Divinity Original Sin and its sequel did pretty good, right? Of course. So we kind of expected that this game was going to do well. It's made by a great developer who knows what the hell they're doing, and it's a big property. Baldur's Gate is part of Dungeons and Dragons, and lots of people know what it is. Valerian Studios did not expect to be at the top of the Steam sales chart. In fact, the game even exceeded the expectations of its early access sales, which was also frankly surprising. In an interview, Larian Studio CEO Swen Vinke said the following, We've seen that in the past. Other games were very successful in early access. Then day of release, they didn't sell a lot more because it was already saturated already. He also said that he was actually kind of worried they might see lackluster sales because of how old the franchise is and how long between the sequels. His first reaction when seeing that Baldur's Gate was among Steam's all-time most played games just days after its launch, uh, his reaction was, God, I hope there's no big bug left. He also said, this is way, way beyond what we expected. There's also no precedent for it. For our type of game to have that many people playing concurrently, everybody's very happy. And that makes sense too. I, I mean, he's of course in charge of it, but me, Falcon, who is in no way involved in the creation of this game, I'm very happy. Like it's a fantastic game. I wanted it to do well and it's done great. At number nine is Battle Bit Remastered, uh, a game that, frankly, when you look at it, you're kind of like, what? This is a success? It looks like Roblox. Well, first off, there's a ton of success stories on Roblox. Uh, a, a lot of stories of people getting ripped off on there, too. Uh, but this is just a full, full ass game. It's a lot like Battlefield, and it has sold more than two million copies. It was also made by three people and just keeps getting better because they keep reinvesting the money that they make from the game in the game. They're kind of surprised. They said, I don't think any one of us had realized what we have actually done and also committed to reinvesting the majority of the money back into the game, which makes sense. Two million copies is a lot, but there's really nowhere to go but up. It's not like DICE has made a great Battlefield game in a while. And if people are enjoying this despite of, or maybe because of the simplicity of its graphics and focus on its gameplay, it makes perfect sense for them to keep working on it. Like if you're interested in a great Battlefield experience and you have $14, Battle Bit's the place to go. Hell, if you have the amount of money that it would cost to buy a full Battlefield game, I'd still probably direct you towards Battle Bit because again, it's $14 and it's, it's better than the Battlefield games are right now. The devs are humble about it and say, well, we think if they had a little more freedom, they could make a good Battlefield game. But you know, Battle Bit. At number eight is Valheim, a game that kind of just came out of nowhere. The co-founder of the studio, Henrik Tornqvist, said in an interview that the interest in Valheim and the sales were just a humbling experience. If you're not aware of what Valheim is, it's a Viking-themed open-world survival game, and it, it, it has a lot of sandbox elements in it where you can build a lot of cool stuff, and that's actually a source of how it really became kind of a thing that people could share, like pictures of builds and stuff on Reddit. And it generates a lot of interest. They sold 3 million copies of this game in a couple of weeks, and they had no idea that that was going to happen. Valheim is, of course, still going real strong and is still garnering extremely positive reviews. It's also still in early access, so it seems like they've really played their cards right. And number seven is Undertale, a game that, well, I don't think anybody thought was going to be that big. I don't even think a lot of people really knew what it was. I mean, in terms of how Undertale happened, it was a Kickstarter that asked for $5,000, and it was funded to about $50,000, which is 10 times more than the asking price, but at the same time, 50 grand is not that big of a Kickstarter success. We've seen games raise millions of dollars and go nowhere. On top of that is created with Game Maker Studio, which is not exactly a robust game creation tool. And with it, he created something that by 2020, and keep in mind, 
I have no idea what the numbers are beyond that, but by 2020, Toby Fox had made over $26 million in Steam sales alone. That's not the only platform this game has been released on. It's arguably not even the biggest platform it's been released on. Toby Fox said, not only did I not expect this level of popularity, but initially I was afraid of it. I didn't want Undertale to become tiring for people or become spoiled before anyone got a chance to play it. Early on, I even tried to contact certain Let's Players to tell them not to make content about it, but the game became very popular, unavoidable even. He talks about how it was really stressful to get a lot of attention too, and that's hardly shocking considering he was basically the only person who worked on the game to the extent that he did. I mean, a couple of people made minor contributions to it outside of him, but it's basically the Toby Fox show, and I don't know if anybody's ready for that. And number six is Five Nights at Freddy's, which, I mean, nobody had any friggin' idea. The guy who made Five Nights at Freddy's, Scott Cawthon, had absolutely no idea. In an interview after he had everything blow up, he said, Did you know last year I was working at Dollar General? I worked as a cashier. I had three bosses who were all still in high school. Before, I worked at Target in the backroom freezer unloading frozen foods. He basically developed games as a hobby, released the first Five Nights at Freddy's in 2014 after years of relative obscurity, and just kind of kept releasing them. It took him about a year to release four of these things, and it's because they have a, a pretty distinct way of telling their stories. They're pretty minimalist games, but he certainly didn't expect them to reach the level of success that they did over that year, with Warner Brothers optioning it for making a movie. Now, that movie took a while to make. They optioned it in 2015, and it's coming out on October 27th this year, but it seems a lot like they took some of the philosophy from the game development, which is keep it minimal, and well, the movie has a budget of 25 million, that's not super high, which is pretty smart. I mean, the recent Fast and the Furious movie made like $700 million in the box office and didn't make a profit. In fact, I think it lost money, and that's because they're making these movies with these crazy budgets. Five Nights at Freddy's might have a chance. And if it does well, I'm sure Scott Cawthon will again be counting his blessings. And number five is Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice, which is really just a fantastic game that tells a very different story and also does it in a manner that doesn't really bother with fluff. It's not the most complex game you've ever played. A lot of the combat scenarios are pretty simplistic. The puzzles aren't exactly impossible to solve and they aren't shy about holding your hand if necessary. It's just so high quality what they did that people wanted it. People spread the word and it really did well. Part of it is the things that they chose to do to the level that they did it were the right things and doing all of those things at the level they did made it appear like this was borderline a triple-a title. It was of course not. It's an indie game. But on top of that, they were also really shocked that the game did so well on PC, thinking that it was primarily going to be a console game, a PlayStation 4 game. As it turns out, PC players loved it and played with mouse and keyboard, which they hadn't really anticipated and didn't really think about as a primary means of playing. It's really a great game, too. At number four is V Rising, which is kind of a base building vampire RPG thing. Like, there's a lot of different stuff involved in V Rising. Uh, you do have your kind of Diablo style combat with your character that you make, and that's some cool stuff. But you also got some survival stuff, an open world, base building, both co op and competitive multiplayer. And while some might be tempted to call it unfocused, it does all of these things pretty damn well. Obviously, it's on this list, so they didn't expect it to do so well. But when they re released it to the early access, there were 50,000 people playing it within a few hours. And its current record is 150,000 people playing it at once, which is crazy. At number three is Among Us. Uh, it's almost tough to even talk about how insane the success of Among Us was. And the thing is, the game had basically been abandoned prior. 
They made Among Us and abandoned it in 2019. They put out a third map, did some bug fixes, and at that point, they were just like, all right, that's good. And then the pandemic happened, and everybody played it. They'd initially planned on making a sequel to Among Us, where they built on the foundation of the first game with a bunch of improvements, but then they realized that the game was just doing so well, they should just take those planned updates and incorporate them into the original, which was the right move. Among Us just got bigger and bigger and bigger, and while it's not being played, played by as many people as it was. I mean, it got pretty saturated, and I think people kind of played it to the point of, oh, wow, I can't do this anymore. But it's still a popular game, and honestly, that's really impressive. And number two is A Plague Tale Innocence, a, a game that just, I mean, if you've played it, you know why it's a hit, but at the same time, you also wonder how it became a hit. It's this fantastic game that I promise you, I've never described in a manner that I felt satisfied with the description. There's a plague, the plague brings these horrible hordes of rats, and a kid can control them. Like, on paper, that's accurate, but that's not why it's great. This is a game that just does such a good job telling a unique story, or at least a story that we haven't felt like we've gone through a million times, and tells it in an emotionally resonant way that also has good gameplay mechanics and graphics. Oh no! No! Light! Enter the light! Quickly! I don't see any torches! How can we... Uh, what are we going to do? Keep them busy. Are you sure? Another ham should be enough. Come on. I mean, by the end of this game, I actually was so invested in this story that I could not wait for a sequel, and the sequel absolutely did not disappoint. Plague Tale Innocence is fantastic, one that I could sing the praises of just endlessly and never want to stop, because nothing about it is done half-assed. The graphics, full-assed. The gameplay, full-assed. The rat hordes, full-assed. The weird priest guy, oh, you better bet that shit is full-assed. Seriously, what an enjoyable game. And finally, at number one is Elden Ring. You might think, oh, well, the Dark Souls games are huge. Why wouldn't they expect Elden Ring to be huge? Well, the, the fact is that Elden Ring is genuinely like one of the biggest things that's ever happened in gaming. It's among the top 10 best-selling premium games in the US market, but the success that it got took Hidetaka Miyazaki by surprise to the point where when asked about it, he said he had no idea what the reason for its success was. He went on to say, I try not to think about it too much because I think it would be a bad idea to analyze it deeply and to consciously try to replicate it in another game. In all seriousness, this man is a lunatic. I mean, on one hand, yeah, I get the humbleness and kind of having an expectation that goes alongside previous games, which very successful games between Dark Souls and all of the offshoots, the Sekiro's, the Bloodborne's, they're all very successful games that people immediately recognize. But I mean, eventually you hit critical mass. Everybody's like, oh, another one? Yes, absolutely. And that happened with Elden Ring. And that's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. The best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription. So click subscribe. Don't forget to enable notifications. And as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at Falcon the Hero. We'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.